Brother David Lister here from Moriel Ministries. He's going to introduce our speaker today and his wonderful family. Go ahead, brother. Well, it's wonderful to be with you all and being uh, asked to bring Scott and family together. His, and uh, I'll let you let him take care of all that. And uh, but I do want to say one of my greatest joys of my Christianity is to be actively involved in missions. It's something that just brings so much joy. And in Moriel, we support people around the world, from Thailand to Japan to Philippines to Australia to everywhere. We have missionaries, and, and it's just great being an administrator that can work with them. And and getting to know Scott over the years has been wonderful. And I, I guess i got to tell you things that he's not going to tell you. He's I've learned he's super intelligent and very, very humble. He won't tell you these things, so I've got to tell you that. So, but he's uh, he's at least trilingual, maybe more. So, and wherever he goes, he evangelizes. Um, um, and he'll, when he leaves here, he's going to be going to um, Amsterdam, where he's going to be doing street preaching. So, he's the type of man that's filled with the Holy Spirit that wants to get his word out. And you know, so. I hope you will get to know him and uh, follow him either on Moriel or uh, wherever on his um, from our websites and updates and things like that. So it's just great to have uh, him here. He doesn't get here all that often. So if Scott, you want to come up and introduce your family and take over. So Scott Noble. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and uh, just introduce my wife and son. Uh, my wife's name is Ke, our son's name is Micah Berakaya Wycliffe Noble. <laughs> we tried to keep it short. <laughs> we actually did uh, take one name out, uh, Octavian, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, how many of you have been to Thailand? Anybody? Oh, okay, a few. Um, so if for anyone who's not been there, just uh, introduce it a little bit. Um, Thailand is very hot uh, all year round. have hot season and very hot season and, and rainy season. And um, very spicy food, very uh, good food, and uh, very friendly people for the most part. Um, also, on the more negative side, there's, uh, I think it's in the top five for road accidents and, uh, and fatalities. And also, um, there's a lot of prostitution in Thailand. I think about, there's about two to three times more prostitutes than there are Buddhist monks. So, uh, pretty widespread. And not not only the Thai people, um, strictly Thai people uh, speaking, but also many of the hill tribes and people from Burma uh, participate in that. Um, so we've been there for 14 years, <laughs> my son. <laughs> and he's been at my side when uh, street preaching before, so it's kind of used to this. <laughs> uh, so we've been there 14 years. I've been uh, married for about uh, nine years, and um, let's see. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to introductions later, and then uh, get into the topic a little bit first. Okay, the the topic today I want to talk about is the heart cry of the Savior of the world. So the passage that Pastor Steve read is um, goes right with that. That God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he would turn and live. And so I want to talk about a lot of uh, sub-themes under that and try to tie them all together under this uh, one topic, the heart cry of the Savior of the world. So I, I've spoken with uh, two people 
who were influenced by Calvinism who told me that in the scripture it doesn't talk about us um, praying for the unbeliever. Uh, but when I went to the scripture to search on that topic, I found uh, many, many um, verses that tell us to pray for the unbeliever, even as basic as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Thy will be done. So what is God's will? In uh, Second Peter and, uh, or I think First Peter and Second Timothy, we have the verses that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all that come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. So we see there what God's will is. He is not willing that any perish. And then when we pray, Thy will be done, we're, we're praying for the unbeliever that they would come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. Um, also, there's uh, Jesus himself prayed for the unbeliever in Psalm 2. Uh, well, actually, the Father um, said, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. So the Father is telling the Son, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And then also in uh, Isaiah 53, uh, Jesus is praying, said, uh, Therefore will I divide, uh, it's the Father first, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So here's uh, another verse, uh, Jesus uh, praying for the transgressor as our example um, to pray for unbelievers. And also the Apostle Paul prayed for unbelievers in Romans chapter 10, the first verse of that. Uh, Paul prayed for Israel, but he also prayed for the Gentiles who were not saved. In uh, Romans 10 verse 1, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and, <clears throat> and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So here uh, Paul is praying for Israel. And uh, there's also verse in uh, Acts 26. Uh, oh, hold on. I need to find that in my notes. Okay, I think it's Acts Okay, I'll come back to that if I find it. So, the uh, Jesus told us also to pray for our enemies, or actually pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, which in most cases would be an unbeliever. Uh, and then, um, uh, too many notes here. <laughs> Okay, another point is, um, is uh, related to this. In uh, Calvinism, there's the, the, the acronym TULIP. And the um, L of TULIP is limited atonement, uh, saying that Jesus did not die for everybody in the world. But there's, uh, there's so many verses that speak to that, uh, such as 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Um, he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So that's a very clear one that uh, the, Jesus' work on the cross was for the whole world. And it doesn't mean that the whole world will be saved because people resist his will. Like we see in uh, Luke chapter 13 that uh, Jesus said, I wanted to gather you as uh, chicks under my wing, but you were not willing. They... Um, they resisted his will. So uh, there are many verses that say that uh, anyone who comes to, to him will be saved. And also the verse that um, says, when one sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. Uh, that 
to me, that doesn't make sense in the, the Calvinist view of things. Because if, if God had determined uh, people who will be saved, who will not be saved, it's all determined, then there's no reason for rejoicing. It's just uh, the same as if we said the bus came on time. Well, of course the bus came on time. It was scheduled to come on time. Um, it's, it's just something that's determined. It's scheduled. There's no reason to rejoice in that. It's like something um, automated. And uh, there's also Isaiah chapter 5. Um, God said, what, what, uh, what could I have done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? When uh, Israel was rebelling, going astray, God said, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Well, under the Calvinist notion, simple. He could have just uh, chosen them, given them the, the desire in their heart to repent, and they would have been saved. But um, God said, what could I have, been, what could I have done more? Um, so there really is a choice that we have to make. If, if there were no choice, we'd all be robots, and there would be uh, no love as if it's all determined, and uh, this person will choose anyway, no matter what. Um, it's just robotic. There's no love. There's no choice to follow God. So that's under the topic, heart cry of the Savior of the world. Oh. Too many notes. Uh, even in the Old Testament, uh, th we see God uh, calling out to the nations through Jonah, going to the Assyrians and seeing the Assyrians repent, even though Jonah did not have a heart for it, but God did. And um, here's another verse, uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Then 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There's uh, also Acts chapter 17, verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's um, pretty inclusive. I believe uh, God is not indifferent about the salvation of any person. So... Well, when we go to the gas station or wherever we go, we, uh, when we see people, um, we, we, can, we can believe, we can know that uh, God wants that person to be saved. Uh, whether or not they will, whether or not they will come, uh, that's up to them. And I, I do believe God draws all people. Uh, it's not that we have the ability in ourselves. I believe uh, we are all rebellious by nature, and uh, we would go our own way if we could, but God draws every person, and it's a matter of us uh, responding, uh, receiving that gift, and uh, repenting of our sins, but we can be confident that uh, God wants every person to be saved. Uh, he's not indifferent to any person that we meet. He wants that, any person that we can meet, he wants that person to be saved. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, okay, I can't find the other verse, but I'll just uh, paraphrase it. From, I think it's Acts 26 or 29, where Paul is in front of, um, I think it's Agrippa, and he said, uh, I would to God that ye were such as I am, except for these chains. And uh, that word uh, would is, um, in other passages, that same Greek word is translated as pray. So essentially he's saying, I pray to God that ye were such as I am. So he's praying for them to God to be a Christian, except for these chains. Um, okay, also under this topic, while we're talking about praying, praying for the lost, praying for unbelievers, um, I want to talk about another aspect of prayer, uh, which is, creeping into the evangelical church, which is uh, mystical prayer. And uh, living in Thailand, uh, 
It's really clear to see how mystical prayer that's promoted by the Catholic Church and now evangelical writers are taking these, um, quoting from these Catholic writers, uh, bring it into the evangelical church. So there's a lot of similarity with that and uh, Buddhism, uh, with uh, Buddhist chanting, Buddhist uh, meditation techniques. Uh, One aspect of that is the downplaying of logic and uh, emptying the mind. Uh, Rationality is uh, out the door, out the window. So in the history of the Catholic mystics, this is very clear, of, uh, such as Anthony of the Desert. He said um, that prayer is not perfect in which the monk is conscious of himself or the fact that he is praying. So uh, he is saying that when you're praying, you're not even supposed to be conscious of yourself or even the fact that you are praying. Um, that's the kind of um, going out, uh, zoning out, and um, there's all kinds of metaphors in the Catholic mystics, like uh, that prayer is like sleep or death or uh, slumber. It's this kind of uh, zoned out, um, casting aside logic. The basis is not the word, the word of God. It's uh, an experience, uh, a feeling, which uh, feelings in themselves, experiences are not bad, but they all have to submit to the word of God, to the logos. And um, the Greek word logos, which in uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word uh, was with God. That word, uh, word, is uh, logos in Greek. And the word logos is the word that we get the word logic from. So the mystics try to say God is beyond logic, or even I've heard people say God is illogical. But um, I believe that's a real insult to God to say that. Um, there's also in the Greek the word a logos. Uh, in the King James, anyway, a logos is translated as a brute, as in brute beast, or unreasonable. So if we say uh, God is illogical, we're saying he's a brute or unreasonable. But um, really, in the Word of God, uh, logic is uh, central. If we throw out logic, we throw out any basis for uh, even communication. Because uh, one word does not necessarily mean what the other person uh, thinks it might mean. So uh, logic is really fundamental in the Bible and even in prayer. There's um, other people such as uh, John of the Cross. He said, the spiritual and the sensual desires are put to sleep and mortified. The imagination is bound and can make no useful reflection. The memory is gone. The understanding is in darkness, unable to understand anything. So, again, it's the same thing. Um, There's others. uh, Francis of Assisi did a repetitious prayer all night, and then he went into a state of, um, like, unconsciousness. Didn't know anything about what happened to himself. Uh, Madame Guillon, I've seen her books in uh, evangelical bookstores. She said... um, Madame Guyon said, do not try to reason out the truth in it, uh, speaking of the scripture. Uh, don't try to reason out what you're reading. And she said, uh, we must therefore continue steadfastly and immovable in our abandonment without listening to the voice of natural reason. Uh, well, I believe uh, the devil would want that, but uh, God does not. And it's the same thing in uh, Buddhism, this kind of um, advice. Uh, In Zen Buddhism, they have the word uh, de-thinking, thinking. Uh, And phrases like beyond thinking. And they have techniques in Buddhism of just uh, fixing on one point in meditation and um, getting rid of any distraction. Um, Ignatius of Loyola did the same thing. He spent the whole night in front of a statue of Mary, the founder of the Jesuits. Um... But that's not a biblical meditation. That's not a biblical practice. We're supposed to uh, gird up the loins of our mind, love the Lord our God with all of our minds. And um, this uh, it's more of a, a Star Wars religion. 
of uh, emptying the mind. Don't think, just feel. That's the advice that's in Star Wars and in uh, Buddhism and in uh, Catholic mysticism, which it's also called uh, contemplative prayer. Uh, Roger Oakland calls it contemplative terror. <laughs> because some people that go into it, they really do have experiences with uh, demons and uh, or they might go a little bit crazy and when they blank out their mind and don't come back to a normal state. So it's really uh, dangerous and unbiblical. Uh, okay. Then um, also comparing uh, Buddhism and Catholicism. There are many similarities, even though on the surface it's uh, very different, but at the core there's uh, surprisingly a large number of uh, similarities. Uh, such as in Buddhism, they have the celibacy of the monks. In Catholicism, there's the celibacy of the priesthood, and which in both of them has led to many um, sexual scandals. And then in uh, both of them, they have a special language for the clergy. In Buddhism, that's uh, Pali, which they still use today, where they will do uh, chanting in Pali language. And in the Catholic Church in the past, anyway, they had uh, Latin, which the, the common people did not understand. Also, uh, prayer to dead saints. They both do that, uh, praying to saints. Uh, salvation by works, they both have that. They both believe in purgatory, uh, temporary hell. And uh, in um, Buddhism, they also believe in a temporary heaven where it's a continual cycle. The only way to end the cycle is uh, nirvana, which is uh, annihilation. So if you're really good, you get to be annihilated. That's the good news. <laughs> um, we have uh, eternal life which um, is a gift, and it's, um, it's not annihilation. It's, um, it's unimaginable beyond, uh, what's the verse in Corinthians, beyond what um, any man has seen or even imagined. Um, God's ways are perfect. In, in Buddhism also, uh, heaven has uh, nobody in charge. There's... Uh, in the Buddhist belief, there's not a creator, and also, in, although they believe in heaven, they don't have anybody in charge of heaven. So it's like um, even more far-fetched than evolution, because uh, in evolution, we have uh, people believe all these complex things came into existence, but it's still not perfect. There's uh, disease and uh, suffering, but heaven is perfect. And they say no one is in charge of that complexity, perfect complexity, and no one's in charge. It's like um, uh, trying to, uh, it's worse than uh, taking a brick factory and making a building or a junkyard and making an airplane. It's um, just uh, beyond uh, credibility that uh, no... Also, in the Buddhist belief, there's the um, idea of karma, which is uh, different from what we have in the Bible, of uh, we, we will reap what we sow. Because uh, in the Bible, we reap what we sow, but God is in charge of that. He will reward, he will punish, but he's in charge. But in karma, no one is in charge uh, of who gets a reward, who gets a punishment. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, difficult questions that for the the Buddhist to answer in that. And at the core, um, just like in Islam, uh, many, many Muslims do not read the Quran. And they are, they're not violent people because they don't read what the Quran says, what they are supposed to be doing following Muhammad's violent example. So many Muslims are not violent. And um, in Thailand, many uh, many people, most people, are friendly, and um, they do not follow the the real teachings of Buddhism, which would say um, be completely detached. Uh, relationships are a hindrance because a relationship 
there's a desire involved, and uh, desire causes suffering, and suffering will not get a person to nirvana. So in the, the ideal Buddhism, uh, relationships are just um, very impersonal, and uh, there's no love involved, because uh, love will cause suffering uh, eventually, a disappointment or things like that. Um, so there are people who do really practice that and are completely detached, which is also unnatural. We're not supposed to follow our feelings like um, in the extreme um, uh, chaotic, hyper-charisma, charismatic, or hyper-Pentecostal type uh, teachers. But on the other hand, uh, we're not supposed to completely cut our emotions off either. So in the Word of God, we have that balance. And um, what, it, what I've seen in, um, in Catholicism and also in uh, Buddhism and even uh, Islam is that uh, the Word is not primary. Uh, in Catholicism, it, at least they have the Bible, uh, but th it's not primary. And um, instead, the ritual becomes important. Uh, the experience, the ritual. In Buddhism, it's also that way. The, the ritual is the important thing. Most Buddhists do not read the Pali Canon. For one thing, it's uh, 45 volumes. It's too much to read. But um, they, they don't follow that. They, it's the ritual. Also in Islam, it's the ritual that's important. Most Muslims do not read the Quran. Uh, so, but for, for Christians, uh, God wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants uh, not just a ritual, but a relationship. That's part of our prayer life. That's why we don't do chanting. Uh, we don't blank out our mind, but uh, prayer is uh, communicative. We, God wants that relationship with us. He wants us to read his word, and uh, this is the only book where the author is with us when we are reading the Word, and we can have a relationship with God when we're reading the Word of God. Uh, some more similarities, uh, begging of alms. In Buddhism, the monks come around every morning. Uh, Kaya's mother still puts uh, food in the monks' bowls every morning. Her dad became a Christian, um, I think, four years ago, and he doesn't do that anymore to uh, her chagrin. <laughs> uh, but in Catholicism, there used to be that among the uh, Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits. Uh, special clothing for the clergy in both. Devotion to relics in both. The use of idols in both. The championing of Buddhist causes by the government in Catholicism and Buddhism. Uh, making merit for the dead and saying masses for the dead. Repetitious prayer with the rosary. Uh, chanting with the rosary and pilgrimages to holy sites, and the use of holy water. So there's a lot of similarities there with um, following the ritual and the experience of things rather than the word of God and the relationship with God. But God's uh, heart cry, the heart cry of the Savior of the world is not that people would do more rituals or that people would zone out their minds, but the heart cry of the Savior of the world is that people would come to a knowledge of the truth and repent. Um, okay. In um, a question that my wife likes to ask in uh, witnessing is, uh, "Do you know the Do you know the owner of heaven?" Uh, so, because in uh, Buddhism there is no owner per se of heaven, and uh, so. When she asks this, she compares it to every building, like uh, this building. If we did not know the owner and uh, get permission, we could not use this room. Or any house, if we don't know the owner of the house, uh, we can't enter in and uh, be welcome there. But heaven is the same. If you don't know the owner, you can't enter heaven. And um, so we used to have some neighbors uh, cast our neighbor, that question, the lady, and uh, she didn't know the owner, but she wanted to, and uh, she she does now. And uh, hmm. 
So, uh, our our neighbor became a Christian, and um, then, excuse me, uh, she she left her chanting behind, and um, uh, uh, her husband was um, an American man from New York, and he was a uh, a uh, prison guard in New York and a watch commander. And um, he thought he was a Christian, but he was, uh, I guess, like uh, many Americans who, uh, they might believe in God, believe in Jesus, but they're not living for him. They haven't uh, committed their lives to him. Uh, he was like that, only probably worse, because uh, he was a, a drunkard and a womanizer and uh, things that might go with that kind of lifestyle. And... Uh, but he became a Christian too, and uh, so uh, now they have a prayer meeting, a revival prayer meeting. It's uh, they have twice a day. They have uh, uh, prayer meetings for a revival. And um, they've really been transformed and see the difference of, uh, between uh, Buddhism and uh, uh, relationship with God, Christianity. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some other things we do in Thailand, we uh, go to the women's prison, been going there about nine years now, and... I've seen some uh, ladies get saved there, uh, one from Canada and another lady uh, recently. She, um, the Bible says that uh, the heathen worship strange gods, and uh, they really are strange. Uh, some of, th- there's uh, the elephant god with all these arms around it, and I really can't imagine why people would want to worship that, but... Um, it's darkness, a blindness that the Bible talks about, and uh, we pray for them to be to see. And there's also um, in the prison, in the women's prison, uh, I'm teaching uh, English vocabulary for massage. So there's another person that teaches how to massage, and then I teach the English vocabulary about the massage. So if they get a job when they get out, they can um, uh, communicate with the customer. And uh, so, but one of the idols is um, this uh, man sitting in meditation position with a tiger suit and a long white beard. And um, so uh, they they come and just bow down to that and put their food offerings on it. And uh, it's like the Bible said, it has uh, ears but cannot hear, has eyes but cannot see. And... Uh, uh, but now, I, the, one of the same ladies that was doing that is a Christian now. She's serving the living God, uh, who can hear our prayer. And uh, uh, it's great to see that. And we also work in the juvenile prison. I think that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think the young men are uh, more uh, confident in their uh, rebellion and not so... Uh, even though they're in prison, but they haven't quite seen that their, their need to uh, for a savior, um, the heart cry of the savior of the world. Uh, Kez's father used to uh, be <clears throat> the chanting leader at the temple. So uh, the Buddhist chanting it's uh, basically the Pali language. Some of it might be in Thai language. But uh, uh, it's uh, chanting, and it's it's not a relationship. It's the so when he became a Christian, he he didn't really understand prayer, and uh, he would take the back of a chick tract as the salvation prayer, uh, and he would say he would pray the salvation prayer every day, <laughs> and uh, but now he's understanding more that prayer is a uh, 
uh, you know, it's not just um, saying a formula prayer, which as good as a salvation prayer is, it's not uh, what we pray every day, but we are, it's a relationship. And um, sometimes there might be a silence, because just like in a relationship, we don't talk nonstop. But that silence is um, outward silence. It's not inward silence that the mystics talk about. So uh, just a pause in the conversation, not, not this uh, blanking of the mind. But I want to compare what the differences are between uh, mystical prayer and biblical prayer. Uh, before I get to that, I uh, want to give a little history of the Quakers. Uh, okay, the, the Quakers, they got their name from uh, quaking, physically uh, shaking or quaking. And it's like some of the hyper-Pentecostal uh, movements of uh, just shaking uncontrollably and this kind of thing. Uh, that's where they got their name, the Quakers. Started by George Fox in the 1600s. And George Fox, he would go around to different churches and uh, rebuke the pastors. And here's an example. Uh, this is George Fox talking. He, the minister, took for his text these words of Peter. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And he told the people that this was the scriptures by which they were to try all doctrines, religions, and opinions. Now the Lord's power was so mighty upon me and so strong in me that I could not hold, but was made to cry out and say, Oh no, it is not the scriptures. And I told them what it was, namely the Holy Spirit, by which the holy men of God gave forth the scriptures, whereby opinions, religions, and judgments were to be tried. So uh, George Fox is putting in opposition the scripture and the Holy Spirit. He's saying that we are to follow the Holy Spirit, not the scripture. And, um, but it's a false dichotomy because uh, the Holy Spirit and the scripture agree with each other. And, um, but he laid the foundation of uh, following what he called the inner light, which he, by which he meant the Holy Spirit. And uh, so this foundation of the Quakers was set in place that um, that subjective feeling was uh, to be preferred rather than the logos, the scripture. And um, in his day, there were people that spoke against George Fox, even uh, John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, he wrote against the Quakers. And uh, Richard Baxter, a Puritan pastor, also did. And um, later, uh, in the next century, Jonathan Edwards wrote against him, and David Brainerd, the uh, missionary to the Native Americans, uh, also did. David Brainerd said, when uh, there were sundry persons of the Indians newly come here, who had frequently lived among Quakers, and being more civilized and conformed to English manners than the generality of the Indians, they had imbibed some of the Quakers' errors, especially this fundamental one, that if men will but live soberly and honestly, according to the dictates of their own consciences or the light within, there is then no danger or doubt of their salvation. So in other words, uh, just be a good person and you will be saved. Um, these persons I found much worse to deal with than those who are holy under pagan darkness, who make no pretenses or not to knowledge in Christianity at all, nor have any self-righteous foundation to stand upon. So um, for David Brainerd, working with the uh, Native Americans, found it more difficult when uh, they had that uh, influence from the Quakers and the uh, self-righteousness rather than uh, trusting in Christ's righteousness. Uh, and uh, the reason I bring up the history of the Quakers, uh, by the way, uh, Quaker Oats is uh, not related to the Quakers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You might know uh, Quaker Oats was founded by uh, Henry Parsons Crowell. He was a godly man. I think he was a Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, but he named, named it that because uh, the Quakers had a reputation of honesty and hard work, but not because he was a Quaker. <laughs> uh, but the reason I bring up the Quakers is because in modern times, we have uh, the influence of two men who were, 
uh, came out of Quaker roots, who are very influential. In, um, one is uh, John Wimber, and he was um, a Quaker pastor. He was in the Quaker church for, I think, 13 years or so. And then um, he was too extreme for the Quakers, the modern-day Quakers. He was actually more of a Quaker than the modern-day Quakers because he was into these uh, physical shaking and uh, extreme manifestations. And um, Wimber, uh, he said, here's uh, two quotes from him. He said, uh, God is above his word. And he also said, uh, God is not limited by his word. So with that kind of foundation, the same kind of foundation that George Fox had, uh, it opens the door for all kinds of um, errors and uh, extreme manifestations. And I think John Wimber was uh, one who attracted uh, more extroverted people who wanted to uh, uh, swing from the chandeliers and uh, that, that kind of extreme thing. But uh, there was a, another man in modern times uh, who I think it attract, attracts uh, more introverted people through uh, mysticism. Uh, he actually is a Quaker still. Uh, his name is Richard Foster. Has anyone heard of him? Yeah. Yeah, he's written books uh, like The Celebration of Discipline and um, other books. And uh, he promotes the Catholic mystics. In his book, um, the original edition of uh, 1978 of uh, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster said, uh, Christian meditation is an attempt to empty the mind in order to fill it. And so that same uh, idea of uh, not thinking, but just emptying the mind, having a ritual or experience. Uh, but he changed that later in a different book, in the later editions. And uh, in his book, Foster's book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, he ties in a quote by one mystic who advised, you must bind the mind with one thought. So it's that um, repetitious prayer, one thought of uh, the same phrase over and over, of uh, binding the mind with that one phrase. Uh, so Richard Foster, he promotes uh, all of the worst of the mystics, uh, including Thomas Merton. Uh, Thomas Merton, who was a Catholic monk and he said, he's uh, died already, but he said, um, Ca Thomas Merton said, I see no contradiction between Buddhism and Christianity. Well, if you say uh, Catholicism, I might agree with that. <laughs> but he said, I see no contradiction between the two. I intend to become a, as good a Buddhist as I can, said Thomas Merton. Uh, and Richard Foster uh, quotes from Thomas Merton and uh, Madame Guillaume, Francis of Assisi, all, all these mystics. And he promotes this among uh, the evangelical church. These books are popular. So I think these two men who, they both had roots in the Quakers. Um, one appeals more to extroverted people and one more to introverted people. And, uh, but either way, it's the same um, result. So the result is that um, the mind is bypassed, the word of God is bypassed, and people uh, prefer an experience that they might say is God, but it's uh, not because uh, the, the word of God is uh, undermined in these um, experiences. Um, in... In, here's a quote from a, a Buddhist monk who is a very committed Buddhist monk, but he said, although Christians make up a tiny minority of Thailand's population, they do a significant percentage of its non-governmental social work. The same is true in other Theravadan lands. The funds for the little Theravadan society, uh, Theravada is a, a type of Buddhism that is uh, most popular in Thailand. The type for the little Theravadan social work that does exist often comes from beyond the community, and such social work is usually done by either Western or Christian influences. Is in the imitation of Christian social work 
or is done to counter the social work Christians do? What is it in Christianity that has made love so central to the life and practice of its followers? What is it in the Theravada that has retarded this from happening? So here he, um, he really hits the nail on the head. But uh, in spite of that, he doesn't go far enough and become a Christian. But instead, um, he tries to reform uh, Buddhism. But he really says it well, that uh, why is love so central in Christianity? Well, because uh, our prayer life is based on love and communication. Our salvation is based on love. Um, not We don't robotically respond, but we have to make a choice out of uh, seeing God's love on the cross for us. And um, it can't be manufactured if he tries to uh, reform Buddhism and try to uh, put love into it. Uh, he might have an outward result of some kind, but it's not what uh, God created us to be, have that relationship with God. <clears throat> so the... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of opportunities in Thailand. Of um, um, there's one opportunity I know of for uh, people, someone to come over, or it can be um, uh, a couple or a single person of uh, teaching English at a kindergarten, kindergarten slash elementary school, and uh, it's a Christian one uh, in a remote area of Thailand, and. Um, there's a wide open door to share the gospel with the children, with the parents, and um, if anyone's interested in that, uh, feel free to let me know. And um, there's also recently we started uh, working with an orphanage of um, mostly, um, it's one that is uh, independent. They just saw the need for it. They're local Christians and they started helping the children. They have 27 children. And um, they're from different uh, tribes in Burma. Uh, we also work with um, especially the Shan tribe, of, which is from Burma. It's the largest state in Burma. And uh, there's a lot of construction workers who are from the Shan state who live in Thailand. And we work with the, the Shan children mostly, but also with the parents. And we have um, a class twice a week with them been doing this about two years now and uh, we they're all from Buddhist homes and we share the gospel with them and uh, teach them English and pray pray for them that they'll be raised up to be uh, future leaders for for the kingdom of God and <clears throat> uh, we also know a man um, he's from the Shan tribe he we used to call him the big student because uh, he, uh, he would come to our children's classes, uh, but he was about, uh, I think, 27 or 28 at the time. And uh, here's the children sitting there, and then he would sit right next to them and uh, learn English with them. And uh, he, we did that for about one year at this uh, village where I think I killed about 20 mosquitoes every time I went there. Uh, really bad uh, environment, but uh, this man became a Christian last year, and uh, his we're still praying for his wife, um, and uh, they have a son, uh, I don't know, son or daughter, a child on the way, and um, so we're praying for for them. He's also from the Shan tribe, and it's uh, exciting to see what God is doing among the Shan tribe. Um, there's also. It seems like the Thai people are not as responsive as uh, some of the uh, Shan people or other tribes. Though um, there are Thai people too who uh, come to the Lord. But um, Buddhism tends to have uh, the same effect that Quakerism did of, uh, of self-righteousness and of uh, making people think that they have what they have is enough. And they don't see a need for uh, more. But it, it's, of course, not always the case. We pray for everyone. We're open to 
share the gospel with any tribe or uh, country or nationality. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, in in summary, then, uh, yeah, Ezekiel chapter thirty-three, verse eleven. Said, I'll read that again. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? So I believe uh, the scripture that I've shared uh, really shows clearly that Christ died for everyone and that... Um, uh, we as Christians are supposed to pray for the unbelievers. And uh, God's heart cry is for the world. He is not uh, indifferent to anyone, anyone's salvation, but wants people to come to know him, to come to know the truth. And uh, so just uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning. And... Um, we're uh, thank you for praying for us, and uh, just uh, we we are looking forward to going back to Thailand and um, uh, working with the the people that we work with there, and uh, want want to see more and more uh, people come to know the Lord and be set free in uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ through. Uh, the gift of salvation, that we don't have to come through any ritual, but that um, uh, it's a free gift, it's a relationship, that God has um, opened the doors wide open, like the wedding invitation in Matthew 22. He uh, calls everyone, anyone who will come. And uh, before uh, the day, day before we came here, we went to a camp about 45 minutes from our house. It's a uh, uh, like a tin shack, temporary dwelling, where uh, construction workers live, and uh, we, there were mostly people from Burma and Cambodia in that camp. And uh, as I was leaving, we took the children there. And uh, as I, as we were leaving, the kids were yelling at me from the back of the truck, and uh, for me to stop because a man was. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, wanted me, uh, wanted a tract, and um, he was a Catholic man from Burma. He's from a tribe that I had never heard of, and uh, so we're. He he said he wanted to come to church with us, but he does not speak Thai and does not speak English. Speaks uh, Burmese. So, uh, but my the friend, our, our, we work with a man who is uh, speaks Burmese. So we plan to go back and um, uh, have Bible studies with him. He's raised as a Catholic, but he really seems to want to know the Lord. So I look forward to going back and meet him. His name is uh, Pasqua. So appreciate your prayers for him, uh, Pasqua. And uh, please pray for Kaz's mom and uh, brother who are not saved. Uh, her mom is very uh, spiritual, but in the wrong way. She does about 45 minutes of chanting every day, of, uh, just uh, Pali and Thai texts, just going through the chanting of these. And uh, uh, very opposed to the gospel. Uh, but her, her dad is standing for the Lord. And uh, praise God for that. So... Um, uh, yeah, God's heart cry for the the world is uh, salvation of people. So we all have a part to play in that. And uh, right here in Ohio, God wants uh, more people to come to know him and to stand for the truth. Like Ephesians chapter 6 says, uh, we not only walk, but we stand and uh, stand against error and uh, stand for the truth. So um, uh, thank you for uh, your attention.
Спасибо. Brothers.